Hello, world. Michael Dowd is the dirtiest cop in the history of New York City. In the 80s, Michael patrolled the streets of one of the toughest precincts in Brooklyn. He also headed a ruthless criminal network that stole money and drugs, ultimately resulting in New York's biggest corruption scandal ever. Mike was the subject of the explosive true crime saga, The 7-5, where he tells all and relives his days as a mobster with a badge. Mike served 12 years in prison for his activities during that time and is widely considered one of the most corrupt cops of all time. Without further ado, please welcome the marvelous Michael Dowd. You fell in love with me over, over Joe Rogan. <laughs> Is that how you guys met, really? Do you, no. get, do, you get, do, you get, do you get a lot of attention, uh, a lot of attention from the females after your Joe Rogan podcast? Um... Too many. <laughs> too much, too huh? Much. <laughs> <laughs> Once too many, goddamn, don't you? <laughs> yeah, that's funny, man. Yeah, I spent the last two hours watching uh, your documentary, The 7-5. Oh, okay. And that was, I was blown away by that, man. Because that was before my time. I was born the year. And I was born in 1987. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So, that was that was quite the eye-opening film to see. Especially by that guy, Tiller Russell. Tiller Russell's, he just done a lot of big projects. like Since then. Since then, yeah. That Was that one of his first? No, he had uh, a couple of, you know, for him, dynamic, but they didn't hit it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then I told him, I'll change your career. Just sit down and listen to me. <laughs> For people out there who don't know who don't know who you are or aren't familiar with your story, give me like a brief background or like a brief summary of, of okay, so where you came from. And I'm here because of the 7-5 documentary, uh, you know, the character in it, who's me, the main character of the documentary called The 7-5, which aired on Netflix for about three years and was picked up by IFC early on. Uh, they owned it, and um, I think they have it again still now, back in their control. But I was a cop in Brooklyn in the 1980s. Uh, when the crack epidemic broke out, uh, it broke out everywhere and broke out on us too, on the police force. We had no idea what we were dealing with. And uh, so the era that I was a police officer was 82 to 92, and I eventually get arrested, and then the story goes from there. Ten years. <clears throat> yeah. What was it like being a cop in New York? Before the before the crack academic right. and after. Yeah, so it, it was a very uh, eerie time because when before crack hit, you had the AIDS epidemic hit, right? So we went from one epidemic to another. Now we're in another one today, right? We're in this fucking COVID yeah. thing, right? So as a frontline cop, we dealt with a lot of these issues in the street first before society as a whole dealt with it, you know? And you sort of learned as you were going, how to handle things. And uh, so it was a thrilling time, to say the least. I mean, you know, nerve wracking, you, 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 you grew up quick, right? So uh, you went in there as a 21 year old young man, sort of. And then you, you know, in, in six months, you've seen more than your mom and dad have seen in their life combined, unless they were soldiers and stuff like that. You were 21 when you, when you joined the police force. Right. And what made you want to join the police, police force? It seemed it, the documentary conveyed that it was, it was like a lot of young guys who had no direction. Right. And they were just like looking for something to do. Yeah, well, it wasn't like there wasn't anything to do. It was more like looking for leadership, looking for mm. guidance. You know, you know, guys in their 20s are fairly immature. Men don't mature until they're about 60, right? <laughs> Some of us still were 65. Is it 60? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm 60 now, and she's still she's telling me I'm still not mature. So, but I'm working on it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, you had a bunch of young guys. It, you know what it was like? It was like a frat house with guns. How's that? Wow, that's like, great. I love that. It was that. like a fucking frat. <laughs> who, would, who wouldn't have loved it? It was a fucking pisser. But the, the honest thing is, it was dangerous. And and you know, so we can laugh about certain things because it's past. You know, but the, the unfortunate thing is that. We all took our job for granted and didn't really appreciate our position. You know, like when you're a soldier, you go to war, you're only fighting for the guy next to you to come home. And then as you look back on what you accomplished, you know, from what I'm told, it's the same thing as being a police officer. When, when you're in there in the, in the battle, you're battling for the guy next to you and yourself, and you don't realize the impact you have on society mm. and the city and the people in general. Right. You know, and, and that's a big subject, right? But everybody think everybody's little, right? We're only one little wheel in the big cog, you know? Yeah, you were a big part of history. That was a huge, that was a major part in American history, that, that little area right there in New York, that time that time frame in New York, yeah, New it, York City. It, yeah, it, 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 it sort of had tentacles into the rest of society for years to come, right? Yeah. And like a whole generation of people were decimated by this, including law enforcement. 
right? Because if you look back, and I don't know if you had the time to do any research, during that time, police departments were devastated by the crack and the money from crack. You know, inter- by their by choices, bad choices that guys made because they were exposed to such. I mean, when you're making seventeen nine a year, and the guy that you pulled over's got seventeen nine in his pocket, you know, yeah, what is with that no feel fucking like? job, you know, uh, and he's sixteen, and you're like, and no license for the car, but he's got a brand new one, you know, it's just, you say to yourself, what the fuck am I doing? Like, you, it's a reality check. What makes sense? So, uh, you, know, you know, of course we're supposed to do the right thing, but we don't always, you know, and that's yeah. where the that's where the fifty one percent good guy or fifty forty nine percent bad guy, and some days they switch sides. Dude, you know? it's crazy that you survived ten years doing that through that period in New York City. I mean, don't you think? Don't you ever like be like, how the fuck am I still well, alive? Well, I, I'll give you an example. Uh, how many years you did? Twelve years in prison, right? Yeah. yeah. So I did like. 10 with the city and 12 with the feds. Anyway, but um, so I should get a pension, right? Um, this episode of the podcast is brought to you by Lucy. Lucy Nicotine is a company founded by Caltech scientists and former smokers looking for a better, cleaner nicotine alternative. Finally, tobacco alternatives that don't suck. Researched and developed for three years to be made for people, not patients. Lucy has created nicotine gum with four milligrams of nicotine that comes in three flavors, wintergreen, cinnamon, and pomegranate. Lucy also has lozenges with four milligrams of nicotine that come in three flavors, cherry ice, citrus, and mint. Lucy lozenges and gums are FSA and HSA eligible. So you can use your FSA cards to purchase Lucy now and it's convenient and discreet. Lucy products can be enjoyed anywhere, on flights, at work, on the go, or even at the gym. We just got the hat rack to quit his vape pen and he's chewing Lucy and he loves the superior taste of the wintergreen flavor. It's 2021. So get rid of your cigarettes, unplug your vape, throw out your dip, and get some Lucy nicotine gum or lozenges. This is the real deal. A subscription to Lucy comes directly to your door each month, so it's simple and you don't have to leave your house, because Lucy has delivery down. Concrete listeners and subscribers can go to lucy.co and use the promo code CONCRETE to get 20% off all products for your first order. That's L-U-C-Y dot C-O. And use the promo code CONCRETE at checkout. K-O-N-C-R-E-T-E. Also, I have to read this disclaimer. Warning, this product contains nicotine derived from tobacco. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. That's lucy.co and be sure to use the promo code CONCRETE. K-O-N-C-R-E-T-E. Back to the show. (laughs) So I looked at it like, so the question was, how do we survive? I bought life insurance. Like, so how many men do you know at like 23 and 24 years old that have like a million dollar life coverage back then? So I had two policies that were over, worth over a million dollars in case I died. <laughs> so, yeah. So, and, and double indemnity was great because if I, I, I always hoped that if I did die, I died by an accident because that mm-hmm. gave you double indemnity, right? So then your family would be covered double. Because that was something a lot of the police officers did. Yeah, because it was crazy. And yeah. especially guys that were doing the th- sort of the things that I was involved in, you know. I mean, I hung out with the Dominican drug kingdoms, you know. So yeah. one day you could be, you know, caviar and, and champagne. The next day it could be a shootout. You know, you didn't know what was coming from one day to the next. And I'm not saying that there was I was involved in shootouts per se, although <laughs> some of sketchy things. But uh, but the reality is it could have been it could have been. So I, I I and I always was like worried about you know. So one of the reasons I stayed in the police force through all this was because I had a child and like. How do you raise a child as, as, as a kingpin drug dealer? It's not like you don't put that on the resume. What does your daddy do? You know, so uh, because at some point I made a decision to really not care any longer about being a police officer, and that was when I, you know, if you see the documentary, I drove the Corvette up to the to the lieutenant's parking spot and said, "Fuck you," because I, I was done. Like, can you catch me, please? Because I just really should. I'm, I think I'm going to be better at that than at being a police officer. Even though I I think I was a damn good cop, you know, as far as being able to do the police work, you know, mm. I, was, I was I was slick. I became slick. I learned the street. I learned the moves of people. Yeah. I learned to know that guy over there is either got a gun or he's got a, he's holding some dope on him uh, just right. by the walk right. and 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 the and the movement of the head. I mean, it's just it's just were you just lot, know. Were a lot of guys in the police force back then numb to it? Like like numb to be able to reading body language or reading somebody like a real like a real New York like a real hustler in New York. Mm-hmm. You feel like that's someone who can 
get along with anybody. That's someone who could talk to anybody and do a deal with somebody. Like, like after, me. Like you, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And that's something that- In need, uniform. Right, right. I mean, that seems like that's something fucking that's crazy. super valuable. <laughs> Especially if you're a cop and you're actually doing your job and you're and you're you know you you're aware of this skill that you have. Did the other guys in the police force have this skill or were they just sort of like um, coming so, to, coming so, to work and? Well, so there was listen. So I guess what I alluded it to partially before in the '80s there were numerous, like hundreds of police officers arrested. Hundreds. I, 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 it comes close to a thousand police officers were arrested from 1990, 1985, when crack really started to hit to 1992 close to a thousand cops were arrested for in being involved in drugs but of course you know i was the i was a, the picture of the of the you know the the white lily long island guy that 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 worked in the brooklyn police precinct and you know he was purveyor of evil against mm-hmm. the poor people in the ghetto get the fuck out of here the fuck they they trained me for christ's sake right right <laughs> no i mean what you did i mean well, first of all, in the beginning, of, like throughout the documentary, I love how the court testimony is weaved throughout the whole thing. It's funny how people love that. I, I, and it's I, great. I, 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 you know what? Because I'm not a film guy, so that almost bothered me to see it. But I can see why every single person that I've had an interview with, which is probably about 100 by now, um, have always said exactly that. It's so, the backbone of the whole thing. It's great. Yes, it, it's, it's weaved through the, through the whole thing. And, and the best part about it, to me at least, was how matter of fact and straightforward and honest you were exactly. about everything. Like it's just, you're straight yeah. up just telling them, yes, I did this and this. Like, yeah. how- well, you know what? Uh, so, so the comment on that is that, so like if people ask, what was that like? You know, why were you so deadpan honest? You know, I, I had like 30 federal prosecutors sitting in the fucking room looking to see me fuck up, okay? That's number one. So if I told anything incorrect or lied or obfuscated, I could be charged with it. And on, on the other side was, I've already been arrested and charged with, you know, I mean, what, what people don't know when we do these interviews is that I was suspected for nine murders in Brooklyn, okay? I didn't do any. But the New York Post ran with the story that they're looking for nine bodies to attach to me. And the last thing on my mind that I'm worried about is a couple hundred kilos or whatever, fucking, you know, 200,000 in cash. I, at this point, I'm still fighting in my head that they're suspecting me for being involved in nine murders. And it was like, this is nothing compared to what these people are talking about. So, so yeah, so so from that perspective, you can understand why it was so easy for them to say, yeah, I did hundreds of crimes. I, I actually lied. I did thousands. <laughs> So, and the only reason I didn't say thousands is because my father was in the fucking audience behind me, you know, watching me testify. Jeez, so I hope they man. don't. I hope I don't get a, a federal uh, sentencing enhancement for not telling the complete truth. I mean, I felt for you in that documentary. I, you know, making the small amount of money that you were making, being a police officer in New York, and seeing, like you just said, seeing all these guys that you were busting that had, you know, tens of thousands of dollars on them. I, if I was in your shoes, I probably would have done the same fucking thing. I would have been hustling with them, stealing money from them, and running around gallivant, snorting coke. Yeah, yeah. Banging hoes, yeah. Banging hookers. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's what that, listen, it was that way. So, But I ha- I was the face of it, right? So every, right. everybody has to be the full guy. And, and I don't lessen my responsibility by saying that. I take a full responsibility for what I did. But, you know, but most guys got terminated. Back mm-hmm. then they'd get terminated. But my situation was I got away with it so long that they were pissed. And then more so that Suffolk ended up catching me on a wire to my partner's, ex-partner's house, Kenny Urell. Uh, that's the guy who ratted on you. Yeah, he put a wire on later, but his phones were tapped. And then that's how they got to me. Oh, okay. He didn't know his phones were tapped, but I knew his phone was tapped. I said, you fucking tapped. And he goes, what are you talking about? I said, I haven't seen you in, six, in four months. I said, the day I show up at your house, there's surveillance on it. Now, what happened to him? He never in, he never even did a day in jail or prison? Yeah, no. he. I mean, when they, the first arrest, you know, when they hold you over, he did that and he got bail and, and went home, you know. But and if, they, gave him, they gave him the plea option. They gave him the plea option to you walk, cooperate. You walk free. And cooperate you, against him and we'll go to the judge and ask him to give you uh, zero. And, and, you know, so it's, it was up to the judge, obviously. Did you ever see him after that happened? Yeah, we made the documentary together. Really? Yeah. What, what was it like being in the same room with him after that? Um, so, so it goes down like this. They asked me if 
f- to do it with if he if they would have. So he, I wasn't going to let him be part of the documentary, okay? Because I, I had a little animosity, I would think. You know, uh, you know, the guy went and lived his life and had a you know good life for himself. Kept his pension that I got him. You know, he never sent a note saying, "Hey, listen, I'm sorry. Good luck." You know, when you get out here, you know, uh, you know, I'll take you and your family on a trip to fucking Spain, whatever. You know, n- nothing. No, no, like, listen, I'm sorry. I did what I did. But, and it's not even what he did. It's, it's, it's just how he did it, you know. Um, he was offered uh, this plea agreement, and, and, and all he had to do was take a plea. But he, what he did was he encouraged me to do further crimes while out on bail and, and put this wire on, and, and, he, and he tried to encourage me to talk about my family, my brothers, my cousins, my aunts and uncles. Like, he tried to get a whole basket full of shit to give to the feds, you know, when the reality is, he did exactly what I did. You know, of course, I, I would take, I, I would be, I'd be lying if I didn't say I was the instigator. But, you know, I mean, you're a fucking grown man. You make your own mind up, you know. Mm. And, you know, he, all, he had to, all he had to say was no. And it would have been done. What was it like, though, when you saw him for the first time after you did 12 years in prison? So I told, I, yeah. So I told the, the director, Tiller Russell, I said, he, there's only one way this is going to happen. I said, I want you and your film crew at the precinct. And I want you to tell him to meet you at the precinct, not me. Meet you guys at the precinct. You want to take a picture of him in front of the 7-5 precinct. So, uh, sure enough, at 12.01, high noon, whatever the fuck you want to call it, you know. So he, come, he came down the block and he turned in front of the precinct and I was standing next to the mailbox. And he came over and I, I just looked at him. I said, Kenny, he goes, oh, he fucking turned white. <laughs> like, ah! So I came over and I gave him a hug. I said, "Hey, you know, we're home. It's over. You know, uh, how you doing? You know, uh, really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what are gonna do? And at this point, you know, we needed him for the documentary in some respects. You know, and uh, and at that point, you know, uh, you miss your old friends. You know, even though you know it's like yeah. a bad relationship. You know, if the time goes by, you know, you forgive each other. You know, mm-hmm. say, hey, listen, we were young, we made mistakes. You know, so it's it's a similar feeling. The only thing about it is 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 it, I, I would like to see, have seen some humility or some, you know, some uh, t- some feeling of compassion for what I had to go through, you know? Mm. So people, but people justify what they do to others by blaming you for what they had to go through, right? So, you know, his life was torturous, you know? He got a three-quarters disability pension and moved to uh, Paseo, Paseo, Pasco County here uh, in Hudson or something like that or the hill what's the hill spring hill you know oh really yeah so so like you know yeah and he had to live with that guilt too i'm sure well so so yeah so to alleviate that uh, alleviate that guilt i said listen you know i must not have been easy on you he and so you know what he says to me i got him in my car he says to me i'm not i'm gonna tell you the truth mike i didn't lose a minute of sleep over this i just wanted to fucking kill him (laughs) He's in my car. I'm driving. He says, I'm not going to lie to you. I didn't lose a minute's sleep over this. You know, because first of all, people don't know that his his name was Scummer. Okay. So everybody has like a little nickname. Mine was Mikey D, whatever. Uh, they had some other name for me too. Doc, they had a couple names for me. And uh, his name was Scummer. So I said to him one day when I was working with him, why do they call you Scummer? He goes, I'm a scumbag. I said, oh, okay, I get it. <laughs> so that, he's no like before I became his partner, he was known as the Scummer. You know, so he was a scumbag, and that's who he is. Wow. So he's true to true to his word, true to his name that he earned. Uh, when I said to him, you know, Kenny, if you just, if I felt as though you you, you had some compassion, I mean, twelve years, I, I kissed bricks, I, I I kissed cement block walls. In my dream, I'd wake up dreaming kissing a brick. You know, yeah, it happens. You know, I know why that happened. I don't know. I'm fucking in prison kissing brick walls. I mean, it happens, you know. And he, at least you weren't kissing other dudes. Well, thankfully, you know. So if in his case, he, he'd turn over and kiss his wife or fuck her, you know. And, I, and I'm kissing bricks for 12 years. So, like, and I, I got two kids that, that grew up without a dad, and, you know. So, mm. so, so, so you don't have to feel bad for me for that, but you should have some compassion, right? Say, listen, I, it must have been diff- not Like, not a fucking, like, like. Like wind going through an empty fucking hole in your head, right through the other side. You know, I'm like, holy shit. Wow. So it was a little bit disappointing in that respect. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that I liked about the meeting was I was in control. He tried to be, but I was in control. Mm-hmm. And he would say something, and I'd say, "That's the way you remember it. That's not the way. It's, that's not the facts." You know, he says, well, how, "Why is it the way you say it's right, and the way I say it's not right?" I says, "For twelve and a half years, I sat in a fucking prison cell, recalling what I did." And what you did, and for that 12 and a half years, you were fucking your old lady and raising kids mm. and, and working. So who do, who do you think would have a better, clearer memory of those days? Right. You or me? 
Did you spend that most of that time, most of the 12 years reflecting on everything that you did? And I would say a good portion of it, you know? So, uh, it was more so that, you know, and that I, I, I tried, I tried to like tabulate it and, and, and document it. I've written it down a hundred times, mm. started it and stopped and started and stopped. In fact, I'm still trying to get it started and stopped. I, I'm, 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 my life rights are owned by one of these, uh, you know, organizations in Hollywood, and, and and they still haven't been able to write the screenplay. How long has it been since you since you sold them the life rights or well, options? This is my third fucking time, so you know, it just keeps happening. You know, and they still keep can't they can't get the uh, screenplay. Wow. So I told them, if you come sit with me, we'll get it. And like like like, hello, you want the story? I I gave you an award winning documentary that's run for three fucking years on Netflix. You think you sit with me? I'll give you the movie. Right. I'll give it to you. I can give it to you today if you want to sit down. You and me. I'll write the fucking. I'll tell you. You write. I can't write well. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Talk I've, to text. I've been talking to my phone now. Yeah, for, exactly. For about uh, about eight days, I've spoken to my phone for an hour a day, and I've got eighty six fucking vignettes where you where you, where you would put the the scenes together. Yeah, I could tell. So from the, I could tell from the text you sent me earlier that you were just talking into your phone. <laughs> yeah, because it was illiterate, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was New Yorkies. So yeah, you, exactly. you you figured it out. Yeah, I know how you guys are. <laughs> <laughs> fucking crazy people. <laughs> I love the part of the documentary where you said that uh, you took from one of your first busts or one of your first, uh, you basically robbed a drug dealer. When you went to his house, you saw the big giant bag of uh, of marijuana and you found a couple oh. of guns and some, and some oh, yeah, cash. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That was and good you said one. you took that money and you went and bought a condo in Myrtle Beach. No, that, was the, that was the cocaine. Oh. That was Noriega's cocaine. Hmm. Yeah, that was Manny Noriega's cocaine. That's what we bought the condo oh, with. So you, you sold his cocaine? Yeah. Where did you sell the cocaine at? I don't remember. I gave it to somebody to sell. I don't like. I didn't hit in the street and sell it to anybody. Right, right, right. I gave it to my partner. He gave it to. A, oh, he gave it to the Con Ed guy. The guy who ran Con Ed. <laughs> Some guy was working in Con Ed. <laughs> they had a good connect in Con Ed. Oh my god! It was the best Peruvian fucking pink flake you ever saw in your life. That's insane. I can't even. I imagine. bought the condo with that money. That was Noriega's cocaine. Really? Yeah. And how much was uh how much was the price of cocaine per kilo back? Twenty eight thousand. Twenty eight thousand a kilo. Then, then, but it consist consistently went down. It ended up down about eleven thousand dollars when I got eighty seven, eighty eight, eighty nine. And it just constantly went down, didn't fluctuate. Was it like Bitcoin when it goes up and down? No, no, it it, it would go it would eventually go up, which is why we ended up getting arrested. Really? How yeah. how does how does that make sense? So so cocaine went from 11,000, and it worked its way up to 15,000 a kilo. Mm -hmm. And it was steady. And then what happened was it went from 17,500 to 34 overnight because it was uh, Easter holiday. And Colombians are very religious, you know? Yeah. So they don't ship cocaine around yeah. Easter. They, they just, you know, they, they cut their fucking movement back. And there was a shortage, and maybe a couple of big busts happened. So the cocaine price doubled. So at that very week that it doubled, Kenny and I got into our own little supply business. And it created more conversation. It, we needed to recruit a few people to put extra money up. And that's when if, if the whole story that people don't really know the whole story is four other cops in the 73rd precinct got involved and, and put their money up because Kenny is a cheap fuck. Instead of coming up with half the money like I did, he had to go recruit three or four guys for 2500 each. And it's just, it's just the way it is. You know, that's right. how he is. So, yeah. What do you think? What What is your opinion on like all of the stuff you see online today? Nowadays, everybody has a phone. You all you see is like shootings with kids getting shot everywhere, and all mm -hmm. the stuff with the guy who got who just got murdered, George Floyd, Floyd. and like all all the stuff that's going on with pre police brutality in the news today. And compared to what it was like when you were running the streets of New York, like what is your this is view fucking on all Disneyland. That? What do you mean by that? This is Disneyland. Compared to what it was back then. Right. Yeah. This is a fucking joke. There's no brutality out there today. And if there is, it seems like most of the time it's captured on... There's somebody with a phone who's filming it. Yeah. <clears throat> you see every fucking incident today. Back then, there was one every three minutes. <sighs> and, you know, I spent the last two weeks with a bunch of rap guys. I can't repeat... I don't know names. I was with these <laughs> bunch of rappers, and they were all from in my era, you know? I was chasing them down the street, you know? <laughs> Because they were selling crack and, and rapping songs on weekends, you know, mm -hmm. and, and so, but the, half these guys I ended up running into, and uh, they were like, it was so much better back in the eighties and nineties. Today, it's fucking, it's crazy out there, you know, because they got their beating, they got their money taken, they went home. 
Right. And, and that, they could keep running their business. They could keep doing their fucking thing. You know, this is them. This is them telling me I'm the cop in the room. We're doing a podcast with a bunch of guys smoking ganja over my head and fucking running around. You know, blood clot motherfuckers. And 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 and, and this is how they. This is how they. Uh, they're telling me, Jesus, it was so much better. You guys were way better back then. Today, everybody gets locked up for nothing. You know. Oh so I mean, God. this is the this is the guys who took beatings all their life, but they. But they were out the next day, and, and they were living a life, and they weren't telling on the police, and the police weren't telling on them. It was just, a, mm-hmm. it was a whole different society back then. You know, the '80s destroyed a lot of people's lives because people learned how to survive in it, or they didn't. Mm. So, when you walk me through like what it would be like, like a day in the life of a police officer in the area that you were working. And, and like a day, not in just any police officer's life, but your life. Like, how, how, what was like the percentage of crime, organized crime you were participating in, and like the percentage of actual police work you were doing? Okay, so I guess there's two different ways to describe it. So there were times when I was just, when I, as an ordinary patrolman, which is what I was most of my career, um, I, I would have two different, I had two different approaches. In the beginning, I was like a glutton, you know, I would, uh, Every job that came over as a drug run, I would go on it. And, and, and there was a 50 of them a day. You know, so you'd call to 50 different drug calls a day. So not everyone did you rob at because, you know, these guys got slipped too. They <laughs> tried to get robbed. You know, and then sometimes you, you would take it. And, or, or, so here's the deal. The police department didn't want you making drug arrests. Okay? So start with that. So now you're a police officer in a crack-infested neighborhood. And you're getting called to 30, 40, 50 drug runs a day. If you're not on one, you're backing up on one. You know, so whatever. So the point is, and we backed each other up out there pretty well because any minute guns start flying and bullets start flying out there. And it was, and, and they, it was a violent neighborhood. It was violence every day. I mean, they probably took, we probably averaged five guns a day taken off the street in one precinct alone, maybe more. All right? So, and we averaged about a homicide every day and a half. So... It, and usually it takes 10 shootings to get one homicide. In the, you know, maybe eight to, to, to 10. Eight to 10 shootings is one homicide. Mm-hmm. So you're talking about 2,500 shootings in my precinct and 100 murders, you know? So in that ballpark, you know, my, my numbers are up right now, but in that range. How many, how many people were you arresting? None. You, were never, you never arrested anybody? <laughs> <laughs> I made 43 arrests in 10 years. That's it. Yeah. I made tw- I, I, think, I, I, I made I 36 imagine. of them in one year. 36 of them in one 36 year. 36 felony arrests in one year. Yeah. And then after that I was done. And after that I'm for done. the rest of your for the the remaining 9 years it was like 10 more. Yeah, maybe less, I don't know. Yeah, that's wild. I was done. I was I was burnt. I, I was done. I was You get in trouble making arrests. So I found out another way to make money. Yeah, making arrests was a big money maker. You know, every every time you make an arrest, usually usually you get overtime, right? So a cop goes from making, at that time, I guess I was making, if I say $23 an hour, I went up to making $36 an hour. So, and, and it, most of the rest work is paperwork and, and drudge work, but it's, you know, paperwork, it's court appearance, it's, it's sitting in the DA's office, it's transporting a prisoner. So, you know, and now, now you, your buddies by the end of this, your buddies, you, you hate each other by the end of this, because you you're with this guy the next 16 hours, okay? You and your prisoner. Really? You're hanging out for the next 16 hours, yeah, together. So if you make an arrest, you're basically just you fucking your, around. Now you with your pal. <laughs> wow. You went from fucking running somebody down, knocking him over the head, to giving him a hug and buying him a beer or something. That seems like know? a pain in the ass. Seems like a waste of time. Why? I mean, why, do the co- why does the cop Well, that's how it was. I'm telling you how it was. And yeah. that's, it's not necessarily that way, but I'm hearing, uh-huh. I'm hearing today that it's sort of back to that again. Really? Because the volume of arrests and the backlogs in the system and, you know... And the, and the no bail because the guys they don't they're not, they don't post bail they're back out and they get arrested some guys got arrested seven times in, in three day, in three days you know I mean they're back out in, two, in four hours mm. so I mean so uh, from what I understand it's really out of control right now but I'm talking about from my experience that's what it was so an arrest equals money so if you don't make an arrest you know I found other ways to make money what was it like so the first time you started working for the, there was the one guy who worked in the but, grocery but, store what we're overlooking is the fact that the police department didn't want you making drug arrests. And you became the armed security for the drug dealers. Make sense? What do you mean? Why didn't they want you making drug arrests? Because it cost money. Interesting. They were only worried about money. It's a city. It's, it's a municipal organization. They're worried about money. Huh. So every time I made a drug arrest for a crack dealer or a marijuana dealer at the time or a heroin dealer at the time, I took myself off the street 
I made 17 hours overtime. I put one guy in front of a judge. The guy went in front of the judge. He got bailed out, you know, for, you know, a day later and the cycle repeats itself. So at, at the end of, at the end of the week, I could make, I could have made five drug arrests at every, you know, one a day. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> once you, once you make one, you're off the street. You get it? Right. So, so they you only make the arrest at the end of shift because then you get overtime the whole, right. the whole run. Okay. So what did they want you doing if they didn't want you making drug arrests? Just be visible. Just to be visible. Be visible so that the homicides would stay down. Okay. And summonses. Okay. And make sure you write your book. Summonses. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I used to write them to Benjamin Ward. He was the commissioner at the time. And when did all this change? When did this... I mean, at some point, there was a, a, a huge push to get everyone that was dealing crack or coke off the streets, right? Yeah. So um, so there was, an era, there was a time when they executed a cop, Eddie Burns. Uh, a drug organization in Queens uh, executed a cop uh, by um, he was guarding a, um, a witness's house and I could be wrong on the year it was either 86 or 88 I, I don't remember quite but so on the back of that the PD and the feds teamed up and they put a joint task force together and went seriously after the crack organizations in Queens Specifically, it was it was odd though because they actually went after the crack organization in Queens, but not those in Brooklyn or Manhattan or the Bronx, you know, because because they, they executed this young cop uh, who was sitting there guarding the uh, witness. Um, so that was where the push came from, and what happened was the Fed stepped in, and there's new laws that they're all complaining about that Joe Biden put in place back in the '80s and '90s. Those laws kicked in, and the Feds began to <coughs> enjoin arrests by city PD. So the city PD and the federal, the federal uh, offices worked together so that they would take them from city prisons to federal prisons. So that began to, I mean, when I hit the federal prison system in 92, there was 46,000 inmates. When I left in 2004, there was 190 or 185,000 inmates. So the population like quadrupled while I was in the system. And most of those people that came in were young, black, ghetto crack dealers. Really? Yeah. Probably 100,000. All arrested for crack. For crack. Yeah. Just for possession? Was there any, like, violence? No, 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 no. Listen, listen. No There's one in there is of... there for, no one's in there for the first sale of crack, okay? Right. No one's in there for that. In fact, they're not in there for the tenth sale of crack. What they're in there for is crack and violence. Mm. So they always say, oh, we're going to let them all out. <laughs> oh, good luck. You know, I mean, you know. And I'm not saying everyone. Don't. I'm just giving you a blanket example, you know. And then there's guys in there that, that sold one kilo of crack to an undercover. And they got life. Hmm. You know, 22 years old, they got life, you know. Right. Well, set up, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. Never sold a kilo in his life, you know, but I, I, they gave him a kilo to sell to you. I mean, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> this is this both fence on both sides here. I mean, that's anywhere. Yeah, entrapment, right? Yeah. It's just, but it's, it doesn't work in a drug case. But that's so fucked up. Yeah. What, so what were you, what, what did you feel like when you first started actually working for like the head of one of these drug organizations? Like you, you were working for these drug empires based out of New York right? and, uh, and you were a cop on duty. Like, was there like a moment, like a shift for you, like a moral shift where you're just like, fuck it. I'm yeah, just going to so, do this. So, so I, I was under investigation already <laughs> as a young cop for shaking down people. And, and so my career took some path where it was clear that they were onto me and were trying to push me out. And, At uh, what point was this? How far in? Oh, uh, I was on, I think, four and a half years, maybe five years at the time. And I went to, they sent me to an assignment in Coney Island. And uh, so Coney Island was like basically, we're, we're shifting you away from where you're at so that you're not in the same position to do the same things. So you have to get a new routine and, and just maybe, maybe you'll actually straighten up and do your job, which I did. So when I was in Coney Island, I did my job and I did, I, you know... What do you do in Coney Island? You eat hot dogs on fucking Nathan's hot dogs on the on the boardwalk. Right. So that's what I did. Anyway, and then when I came back from that, uh, the seven seven had broken. It was it was a scandal in the seventy seventh precinct. Thirteen cops were arrested for doing what we would, what we were doing. So everybody around me left. Like two went to Nassau, two went to Suffolk, two went to Florida. One just quit and went to North Carolina. Another guy got arrested for something stupid. You know, another guy went to the rehab. Two guys went to rehabs. So I came back from, I came back from Coney Island and there's a lot of stories that I, I'm just glossing over right now. I came back from Coney Island. No one wanted to work with me because anybody that I worked with was gone. One guy went to Key West. <laughs> just, 
And the reason he went to Key West so he can run to Cuba if he had to, to get the fuck away. I mean, this is and this is for real. <laughs> so New Yorkers love Florida, man. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's the second borough, so fifth, sixth borough, whatever yeah. they call it. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. So uh, he he was in Key West or whatever, and uh, and and I'm up in New York, and I'm I'm the only one holding the bag, and like they're looking at me like, what the fuck, man? How how are you still on the job? So it was difficult to get a partner, and then eventually I worked my way in and, and, and started to earn the respect of the guys a little bit again, and then I ended up working with Kenny Urell, and uh, we right. became partners. So, so at that point, it turned from being so. So what? So I took a different approach to everything. But I, you know, I'm watching the monotony here. <laughs> I'm getting tired of not making money. You know, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm, I got high mortgages, I got four homes, uh, you know, condo on the ocean, you know. <laughs> I, I got some bills here, you know. Yeah. So, so, I, and I lived okay because I had rental incomes and whatnot. But the reality was that I was so used to that extra money. Who, you know, when you start bringing in an extra two, three grand a week just to say hello, you know. So what happened was I uh, met this guy Baron Perez, as you see through the documentary, as it works out. He was the Auto Sound City guy. He he owned an automobile um, uh, shop where they put the music in. And who goes to put these forty thousand, thirty thousand dollar music systems in their cars? Drug dealers, because they had a lot of cash to bury. And uh, so I would be, a fr- I was a friendly side at his, at his shop, you know, because I pulled the patrol car up, he'd put a new Benzie, back then they had Benzie boxes, I don't know if you guys even know what they are. What the fuck's a Benzie See, box? I knew, you don't even know what a Benzie box is. Look it. it up. <laughs> it's, Look it up, Austin. It, yeah, what it is, is back then they would break your window and then break your dash, like ruin your dashboard to take out your radio. Because the blah punk was a big thing, and you don't, guys don't even know, you missed this whole thing. People would steal your blah punk radio. Because it was worth, I don't know, eight hundred dollars, whatever the fuck it was. I don't know. If it was worth two hundred dollars, it was worth more than what they had in their hand, right? Mm-hmm. So back then they began to do these things called a Benzie box, where you'd pull the put the radio in, pull the radio out. So when you left your car, you would take the radio with you. But what happened was most guys would take the radio and put it in their trunk, <laughs> or take the radio and put it under their seat. So they'd break your window anyway and go under your seat and get it. I lost four. Okay, I lost four Benzie boxes and four windows. Is that wait? Isn't that the thing where the <clears throat> like the face plate of the radio you could push it and it would come off? You could like throw it in your throw it in your backpack or something. Remember that? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That's the that was the new Benzie. That was a new that Benzie. Was like the new age that was Benzie a new box. age Benzie. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. So I the mean, whole radio came out. You know what kind of? I mean, what kind of an impact did the police force actually have on that part of New York? Like, if, if were you seeing any changes being made? Was there any progress? Was there any kind of like it was dent the fing- on crime? It was the finger in the hole of the dike. <laughs> yeah. You just were holding the fucking water back. And, and, and really the sad thing is, the truth of the matter is, the cops could have handled it all, but we weren't allowed. And you see, does that? it's a repeating theme, you know? The cops could have handled it all, but, you know, the cop's job is to be, you know, a, a politician or, you know, a nice guy, you know? So the heavy-handed cop would get in trouble like any other time. The thing is, thank God they weren't fucking on uh, camera back then because there would be a lot of guys. 80% of the force would have went to jail back then, okay? Straight up. What do you mean you said you guys, if they would have let you, you could have fixed it? What do you mean by that? Well, because uh, we weren't allowed to make arrests. And, you know, there's ways of, there's ways of convincing people to move on. Or stop. And it was not... So being a cop is, is not necessarily what people think it is, okay? So I know you're standing on that corner. It's fucking snowing out. It's 2.30 in the fucking morning, and you're out there with your three friends. What are you doing? I know what you're doing. You know I know what you're doing. But I can't do anything. Do you get it? I mean, this yeah. goes... This is how it is. So, I mean, because... There's no reason for you about the, with your fucking... Back then they had igloo, whatever those... They had, they had the fur around the fucking collar. Oh, yeah. And they came out like this. <laughs> like an Eskimo. Right? Eskimo. They, thank you for the word. They had the Eskimo hats uh, and, and, and coats on, and they'd be there for... The whole, they have shifts. They had a shift. And they, they changed shifts when we changed shifts. So it was like, perfect. They, they Oh, what are you doing? I did a 4 to 12. Yeah, I got the 4 to 12, too. You know? All right, homie, listen. While I'm out here, when I'm out here, nothing I can see. You got it, boss. I mean, that's what I would tell them because I would go to the bodega, sit down, and have a couple cold ones and, and eat. You know? Was this before or after the pimps were running the streets in New York? This was after, after. right? That this was in the seventies, yeah, I think. That was yeah. the seventies. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, crack took everything over everything. Of course, it was very violent and very, very lucrative. So, well, crack. I mean, crack's basically the same thing as coke, right? Yeah, it's, it's just cooked. it's just cooked it's in a cooked pot with some baking soda or something like that. Yeah. 
Uh, did, did, I don't know. I never made it. Never tried. You it. never tried smoking crack? No. Really? No. Yeah. Hmm. I always said I was like I would like to try it once just because I've seen so many movies about it. <laughs> like what's his How name? About it? Wall Street. Yeah. It won't kill you. <laughs> <laughs> no. Might, lead, there, might lead you out. You might end up sucking dick somewhere because you need more. <laughs> that. Watch yourself. <laughs> was it there an NBA player who uh, who died? From yeah, it? Len Bias. That changed the world. How did it change the world? That was before my time. Right. When so Len Bias died, he was he was he was drafted by Boston Celtics, right? So this is where it becomes interesting. The Boston Celtics, who's in charge of the Boston area? Kennedy, right? The Kennedys run the Boston whole area, the Martha's Vineyard shit and all that stuff. So when Len Bias smoked on that crack and killed himself, he never got a chance to play. The best player in the NBA, you know, best player at the time drafted, never played one game for the uh, Boston Celtics. Ted Was he Ken really drafted number one? He's number one, yeah. Wow. Ted Kennedy uh, came up with these laws, these crack laws, and said, we need to crack down on the crack laws and, and, and these crackers and these crack babies and all this other shit. So he went haywire. He put these laws in place, which, which did a great job. I mean, five years later, after Giuliani took over, you can walk in Manhattan on like Disneyland. You know, 42nd Street was clean. Everything was clean. Oh. So the crack laws... Eventually did their job. The problem was along the way, the crack laws alienated a lot of people and a lot of people got burned by crack itself, including myself. You know, it was part of my demise was the, the money from crack in the street. Right. And the, the crack law specifically were basically if you got busted with crack, it was way worse of a, right. a prison or a jail right. sentence. Right, but, but got, yeah, but not in the city. Versus coke. Right, not in the city, but in the feds. So in that's how feds. it became effective. Ted ah. Kennedy was a federal uh, federal um, senator, senator from from. Boston area, right. Massachusetts. So he and Joe Biden and that crew put together these vicious crack laws to help clean up the cities. And it did. It's just when it cleaned it up, it was they were vacant. Really? Joe Biden was around back then? Oh, yeah. He's That's still around. Crazy. He's Fucker. still he's barely hanging on now. Fucker. <laughs> And then mm. when did that start changing? Didn't didn't Obama start trying to roll that back and try to? Yeah, you know what it was. Uh, and, and so so to his credit, he tried. But the, the reality is, Democrats are always considered weak on crime, right? So if he was able to pull off what he wanted, what he wanted, everybody free, because clearly he's still running shit. You do know that, right? He's still Obama. He's, he's running this. Yes, he, he's running this right now. So so what happened was they they didn't want. I thought it was goddamn Nancy Pelosi. No, no, he's running this. Uh, they didn't want. Um, they didn't want Trump to be the, the, the guy who cleaned up their drug mess, their drug penalty problems. So every, so every time Trump wanted to introduce something, they would not, they wouldn't go for it because they didn't want anything positive on Trump. So he had he ended up doing executive order to promote you know, what he called pardon this one, pardon that one. He was pardoning these people, and he did change some of the sentencing laws. And and what happens is people don't realize is that most sentencing laws, they're, they're oppressive sentencing laws, but they're designed for a reason. They're designed to make you want to tell on me, okay? And that's what is the, the, the that's why the laws were designed the way they were. Mm. So, and every person is given that opportunity at some point, usually. Not all, but usually most individuals are given an opportunity to, to cooperate. In Kenny's case, he cooperated without going to prison. He cooperated, stayed in the street, put a wire on against me. And then, you know, so he won. But anyway, um, so th that's why the laws were designed the way they were. So they would be very heavy-handed in their sentencing, and they would bring... So one of the, one of the things was they, they wanted everybody to be arrested. That was the federal goal, to arrest every person selling drugs. It's the best idea they could come up with. And, and, that, and that was their approach. So if you came to... If you got arrested by the feds, or city and the feds joint task force, you, if you brought in 25 of your best friends... You would get a two-year sentence, and each one of your friends would cooperate against each other, and they'd all get five-year sentences. So you'd win, get two, they'd get five, and then they could go home. If they didn't cooperate, they got 50. So, so they all fucking turned on each other. That's a crazy and they, fucking system. Yeah, and they bro. filled the fucking prisons up, and they cleaned the city streets out, and then most of those guys came out, and they, they got the hint. You know, they, they get the hint now. If you did a one to ten, if five repeated, you know, whatever. But the fact is, when you sit down for eight, ten years, fifteen years stretches, you know, you, you're, you're just tired. You just, you know, they beat you out. They beat you down, and they and they did that to most of the people. And if they and if they didn't straighten their lives out, they know what the next. They know they were offered a forty-five year plea, and they got offered six. Right. So they know the next time they show up, there's no offer. You know, you're going. Do you think most of these crimes or most of this violence and everything would be... A lot of people say that a lot of this stuff would be fixed if just all this shit was legal. Okay, so my 
my thing on drugs laws is there should be none. No, no drug no laws. No drug laws. Yeah. The war on drugs was complete fucking... It's a disaster. Yeah. It's been a disaster. More people have died fighting the war on drugs than people that have died using drugs. And it's just created billionaires in Mexico and Colombia. And yeah. Right. And I, I, I'd i like a piece of that fucking money myself. Okay? I'm not going to lie to you. But, <laughs> I don't, but I'm not you know, not allowed. So You and, got your and, fair uh, share, Mike. Uh, okay? Well, that's what they say. But I came out broken, uh, you know... Really? You didn't stash any before you got locked up? Well, you know, you don't think you're going to get locked up until you do. Mm, yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know, four houses in a condo on the ocean. You a lot of cash laid into them things. You didn't bury any cash <laughs> anywhere? No. Oh, a little bit, not so, much. <laughs> so what did you actually get charged with? What was your actual charge? Was it was it uh, RICO? Yeah, I was eventually charged with a RICO statute, but that, that would that consumed or subsumed or you know contained the uh, actions uh, throughout my career. Uh, so... Um, so uh, when I walked in, they offered me a, a plea agreement for um, 24 to 30 years. I said, what the fuck? This is what you this you get it? I walk into prison, never been arrested in my life, right? I was like, ah, oh, I'm a pretty good kid. You know, uh, I walked in, I was offered a plea for 24 to 30 years. And I'm like, are they fucking serious? Like, my lawyer's like, calm down. You know, this is just the first. I said, just the first offer in 30 fucking years? I mean, who did I kill? Of course, a month later, they put a story about me killing nine people. But anyway, which I didn't. But um, so, like, can you imagine, like, you're facing 30 fucking years? I'm like, what did I do? You know, I, I, I took some fucking money. How old were you at the time? At that time, I was 31. Yeah. I took some money from some drug dealers. So what the fuck? You know, we just exchanged. We bought it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But, but you, you know what? I laugh about it now, but it, it, it wasn't it wasn't a nice thing that I did. I mean, you you had one hell of a fucking life. In your in your heyday, you were having you had these drug kingpins paying you what eight grand a week, something like that. Yeah, that wasn't enough. Basically, just to tip them off on shit. Yeah. Just basically to and half of it I made up because you had to produce, right? I mean, what, right. Like, what are you right. paying? Make it look like you're actually doing something for them. Right. And one time it worked out that I I saved Diaz's organization one day. And who is Diaz again? Uh, Adam Diaz is the Dominican guy who was introduced to me by Babin Perez, the Auto Sound City guy who ran the shop, auto shop where all the drug dealers would go to his shop. How big was his organization at that time? And and how what? How, um, how much of he the probably had thirty men working for him. He had four stores uh, that he sold out of. Only one I knew, but uh, actually two. So so these guys were selling. What just coke? No, they, he, had, he had three different spots. He just sold cocaine. He so so he sold he coke four, four, out of four or five. Stores. Yeah, he, so you go to the grocery. So if you see the movie, you can come to my store. You can get people, Heineken. People. You can get Pampers. <laughs> you can get a kilo. <laughs> you can get anything at my store. <laughs> His bodegas were very successful too. You can buy some Cheerios, yeah, Cheerios and you can buy an eight ball. An eight ball, whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, but he yeah, but he most of his was, was weighted. He distributed mostly weight. You know, but he had one or two spots because everybody likes, you know, the lower you go on the number, the higher the the, the profit margin is. So right. he had one or two spots that sold eight balls and stuff like that, which I didn't know about until if I had known all I if I had known all I found out because when you when you get when you get arrested, you get all the documentation from the case. I was tied into his case, and I got all the documentation from his case. You know, he's pulling in a hundred thousand a week in profit, just in profit. Yeah, if I had fucking known. I get twenty thousand a week. What the right, fuck? Right, I mean, right. I'm risking my freedom here. Dude. So is that the way most of the coke dealers worked in the city back then? Is they just basically had a couple grocery stores and they would sell coke out of the back? Bodegas how, were the way. Bodegas. Yeah, because you can go in, right? Legitimately walk into a business, and instead of hand, hand the money over to the register, you went to the back of the bodega and handed them a uh, you handed a shoebox full of you know twenties or fifties or hundreds, whatever it was, and out. Right. And fifteen minutes later, down. <laughs> Down, they had hatches and shoots. They had, you know, like you go to the bank and they, they have this thing that sucks. I don't know if you. Yeah, the tube. The or, tube, yeah. yeah. They had the same thing in the fucking uh, bodega. I'm really? Like, yeah. <laughs> that's wild. And everyone was buying like like large amounts. Well, that's that was his, that, this is his thing. You know, it'd be. That's you know, how he sold to like the street dealers. Right. Oh, okay. yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. So he would, he would pick up 100 kilos and sell them in a week. <sighs> yeah. And where was he getting the kilos from? Um, so I didn't get that. I didn't get that to that part of the routine. But from what I hear and what he said, he got them from large distributors that were tied to you know uh, the big guys, uh, the Colombians, like the Medellin cartel. Yeah, the cartel. Yeah, Pablo and and stuff like that. Yeah, that guy. That guy was pretty interesting. In the documentary. Adam he had a, was. He had a very uh, interesting demeanor to him. He what like there was like uh, so many 
there was one scenario where uh, you guys robbed or somebody robbed a store or something like that, and there was two guys. There was two guys who robbed somebody else's store. You could yeah, his, his cousin's store. His cousin's store, or whatever. Yeah. And then uh, he sent you guys after yeah. after them. No, we went. He sent us to rob his cousin's store because his cousin was robbing him. And but weren't there, was taking his business? Weren't there two guys that at one point in the documentary? I remember they're asking him, "What happened to these two guys that robbed your store?" And he was like. They're not around. Oh, I mean anymore. Franklin. They're not around. Franklin anymore. and Coke. Franklin and Coke. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. They're not around anymore. What was the story with those guys? I don't know. They're not around anymore. <laughs> Is that part of the Rico? <laughs> Actually, I don't think so. But <laughs> let's just say yes. I don't know. <laughs> they're not around anymore. But you were the one who tracked, tra- who chased. We them got down. them. Yeah. We got you them. got them. Yeah. And they're not around anymore. I don't know about that part. Oh. Okay. Yep. But I was told they're not around anymore. Okay. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. But I was told they're not around anymore. But I didn't have anything to do with that part of it. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought, I no, thought I found them. But I... Mm. So I found somebody that... Yeah, I found them. He's over here. Mm, got it. And you just told him where they were. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I understand. I yeah, understand. That, they're here. Yeah. So that guy was making $100,000 a week in profit only. How much time did he get? Do you know? Do you remember? I know, he, I, know, I know he did eight years initially. So, and he said he wasn't, he, was, he said he was charged with money laundering, not cocaine. Oh. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I didn't read his papers, but that's what he said. Mm. So, and we've spoken. It you know, seems we, like I speak guys, to him every couple of days. Do you really? Yeah. What's he doing now? He's <laughs> running a laundry He's mat? rolling cigars. And, <laughs> he's rolling here. He's rolling here. Right here. Are you serious? What does that say? The, the 75. Right. It's a cigar. The, the mind of Brooklyn, land of fuck. <laughs> Brooklyn's the land of fuck? Is yeah. that what it's Welco- known? It says, welcome to the land of fuck. Why is it the land of fuck? Explain that. What does that mean? Okay, so in the movie... That, I remember from that, the movie. That term was used, yeah. So, you know, that's why they, we put that on the uh, the T-shirt and the cigar label. So yeah. is he still in Brooklyn? Is he still in New York? No, he's been deported to DR. Oh, he's yeah. deported. He, his he's family deported. has a, a tobacco um, plantation in, in Dominican Republic. Yeah. Wow. The largest, second largest, Palma. Palma Tobacco. And who's the other guy? What was his name? Chino? Chico? Chico. I mean, Chicky. <laughs> Chicky. <laughs> no, the other guy. The other guy who had the small little baby cartel. Uh, 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 or the small little drug gang. The first guy you started oh, working oh, for. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, gosh. I, yeah, yeah. He's dead. Um, Is he really dead? Yeah. Um, They killed him. His own people killed him. Um, oh, my I'm God. trying to think. Uh, what the fuck is his name? <laughs> anyway. Yeah. That his name was like Chico or something. Yeah, and, something and, like and, and his, uh, his gang was I, I, can't, I can remember. I'm getting old. His his gang was called The Company. La, La Com- Company. La yeah. Company. Yeah. yeah. La Company. Right. Yeah. I pulled him over. Yeah. First day. You pulled him over after you found out. He put a hit on me. He put a hit on me. He put a hit on me. And how did you how did you find out that he put a hit on you? Well, first of all, he put a hit on me because he shorted me seven hundred dollars. And um so I, I, I made it made it known that I wasn't happy about it, that he should come up with the seven hundred dollars. And he said, you know, fuck you, uh, I'm not paying you. I said, Okay, uh, that's fine. And then I put pressure on the store for about three days. I would park in front of his store. I chase his customers. I paid another organization, another bunch of cops, sit in front of his store for a fucking four or five nights when I wasn't there, and chase him and, and bother all his clients. And then all of a sudden, I, my pager goes off nine one one. You know, we had pagers back then, beepers, and uh, it's Baron's shop. And then I said, "What's up?" You know, he doesn't usually page me, especially nine one one. And he says, uh, "You got to come see me." I said, "All right." I drove in just to see him. I was on my way to work, uh, four to twelve. And he said to me, uh, put a hit on you. I said, who? And he said, uh, the fuck is that? Chico. Uh, Chino. 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 Yeah. Chino. Put a hit on you. And um, I said, uh, I said, okay. And uh, that I turned out my 4 to 12 shift. I had this female partner, I think, with me. And I, and I said to her, hold on. I got to pull this car over. I never saw this car in my life. But I knew what his car looked like because I was told. So I just took a guess. This is his car. I hit the lights. It was near a store. It was, it was within a block of a store, up by Norwood and, Norwood and Fulton. If people, anybody listens, Norwood and Fulton by the uh, elevated train, by the station, the empty, where the stair, staircase comes down. I pulled him over. Uh, I said license registration. He's reaching like he doesn't know. He doesn't know that I, I want to kill him. <laughs> he doesn't know that I want to kill him right now. And I'm hoping to see a gun. Aren't you freaked out? This guy's like super fucking violent. Yeah. Yeah, Just let's um, start spraying. Well, let's, let's go. <laughs> I'm here. So I'm looking in his car, and I'm looking to see if he opens his glove park. Is it, there's a gun in the car. I'm killing him. 
Really? I'm killing him. I'm not going <laughs> to. What would you do? The guy just said he's going to put it on you, right? So right. I'm killing him. <clears throat> and uh, so he takes, he gives me his license, like, you know, hey, what's, here's my license registration insurance card. I take it from him and I look at him and I throw it in his fucking lap. I said, you put a fucking hit on me, motherfucker. He looks at me, oh my, he turned as white as, uh, I don't see it, as white as a fucking t-shirt. And so anyway, so I told him, you know, why don't you get out of the car? Oh, I hit my fucking elbow, I'm skinny. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Were you a splinter? No, just my bony fucking oh. elbow. Um, so I said, why don't you get out of the car, we'll do it right here. You put a fucking hit on me, let's do it right here, broad daylight, you and me. I said, we'll do a fucking Mexican fucking walk off, let's go. A <laughs> shootout. Yeah, fuck the okay corral, motherfucker, let's go. And he's like, I said, you call the fucking hit off right now or, or I'm coming to see you. So I gave him the chance. And he said, all right, all right, all right. I left. I got my pay, my beep, my beep goes off about 20 minutes later. He called up, he pulled the hit off. Meanwhile, the fucking precinct knew and never told me. The precinct knew there was a hit on me. How would they know? They got snitches everywhere, bro. The feds were in that organization somewhere. What the and fuck? And they never fucking told me. You remember the in the in the you remember in the movie, Joe this guy Joe, Detective Joe Hall's in the back of a van, and they yeah. came out with the street sweepers. Yeah. Well, there was a guy in that van that was pointing out all the organizational people because they it was a snitch for them. They knew that they put a hit on me and never told me. That's fucked up. Yeah. Well, <laughs> they didn't want me, I guess, around. That's fucking wild, man. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy that you, at such a young age, were able to, I mean, develop that that street mentality to be able to coexist with these guys and, and work with them and make money with them. And, like, even how uh, the one guy that, that runs the cigar, rolls the cigars, who was talking about you, he was like, yeah, I could talk to this guy, and he was just like me. Like, I Is that a compliment? I, I could recognize <laughs> I don't know if that's a compliment. Well, yeah, well, like, he, he's a street guy, you know what yeah, I mean? Right. Like, He's a New York guy. I can talk with him. I can, I can, you know, hustle bustle with him. And he's not like a normal cop. Well, it is. I, I think if if you show vulnerability, and and I mean by that, I mean you take risk. Like like if you take risk, people accept you more, right? So, for me to have the balls to come up to somebody and say, you know, like I, I'll give you a funny example. I was uh, working in seven five with my partner at the time. His name was Jerry. We pulled his car over two eighty ZX maroon. Back then, that was the hottest cars, you know. It was maroon or burgundy colored, uh, 280, 280ZX. I pulled them over, and I, and I go to toss the car. Because I know he's a drug dealer, because that's, that's their car. And uh, I toss the car. I can't find it. And he's looking at me. He's, like, sweating his fucking balls off. I says, all right, you're good this time, you know. And I let him go. And now I get transferred to Coney Island. Remember I told you I got transferred to Coney Island? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm walking to beat in Coney Island, and this Hispanic guy, a little short, stocky guy, he says, hey. Batman and Robin. And I don't know who the fuck Batman and Robin are. <laughs> it's me and my partner. That's our nickname to them, right? So I go, who's Batman and Robin? He goes, well, he's Batman because he's taller than me, and you're Robin. I go, okay, what's up? He goes, you guys are in the wrong precinct. So, oh, oh, so, oh you're really smart, you know, because cops take their numbers from their old precinct and put it on their gun belt. So if you see it back in the day. You take your, you put your new numbers on your shoulder, so 6 0 precinct, because that's Coney Island. Mm -hmm. And I put my 7 5 numbers on my gun belt. I said, You saw my fucking gun belt numbers. He goes, No, you pulled me over in the 280ZX. I said, Burgundy. He goes, Yeah. I said, The back trunk. He goes, Yeah, because you, you, it was a hatchback. Yeah. He said, You missed it. There was 10 kilos in there. <gasps> I said, You motherfucker. <laughs> he says, All you had to do is pull that fucking, the, the, uh, the mold. There's a there's a, a like a plastic mold or a, that gives like a cardboard mold off the the wheel well. He said it was in the wheel well. I said you motherfucker. Jesus. Goes, but when you come back to the seven five, I got something for you. Oh yeah. What do you mean by that? Like like, I want to work with you. Oh yeah. Yeah. He says. I said. I said. I said. I said Why? He said because you never try to lock nobody up. You just want some money. <laughs> So I said, you fucking motherfucker, you got me right. <laughs> he said, we used to call the police. We used to call 911 to see who shows up. And when you and your partner were working, we knew we were good for the night. <laughs> this is how fucking criminals work, That's right? That's amazing, They man. would check on themselves and see who's going to roll up. So anyway, so yeah, wow. that was, that's, so that's what it's like, you know. Yeah, I think cops are a different breed nowadays than what yeah. they were back then. Yeah, they're different. 
Especially around here. I don't know how much time you spend in Florida. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're nice guys. They're nice guys. Yeah, they are nice guys. I mean, fair. They're fair. Yeah. They're fair. I find them um, squared away, you know, military-ish. More, on the, more yeah. on the lines of military than, you know, that approach to things, you know. But, you know, once you let them let their guard down a little bit, they're, they're human like everybody else, you know. Mm-hmm. Which is... Which is the truth. I mean, you know, where the, tomorrow your brother's a cop, you know, or, you know, or your, your uncle's a cop or your, your aunt's a cop, right? So, right. you know, well, your neighbor. Yeah, it's not, it's not a job that I envy. I mean, especially nowadays. Yeah. With I, the spotlight shining on, on everybody and everybody. all the phones and everything. Well, so, so that's funny because you bring the spotlight. I, am, I was the first advocate, of course, no one listens to me because I'm a dirty, rogue, fucking corrupt cop. I was the first advocate be, behind every cop should wear a fucking uh, camera. Really? Yeah. yeah. Every cop should wear a camera. Well, because it keep you honest. Yeah. On those moments where you... Because well, p- people... Don't forget, human beings put these uniforms on, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it keeps you honest. And, uh, and most times, cops do the right thing. Most times. Mm-hmm. Like 99% of the time, they do the right thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, you might not like what they did. <laughs> you might not have wanted to be arrested. But it's an ugly situation in any, in any respect... If a, if, if, a, if a patron or a perpetrator doesn't want to get arrested, it's going to get ugly. Right. So you're asking a human being to do the job of a machine. And that just, it's, you know, that doesn't really. Yeah, the cops are humans too. Yeah. You know, you know you, if you spit in my face, I do want to knock your fucking teeth out. <laughs> right, right. You know, I, I, just as a man, right? So, yeah. so you know, that guy's still a man. You just spit in his fucking face. I mean, I don't know how they do it today. Uh, he's throwing rocks and bricks and fucking urine and shit at the cops. I would. <laughs> I saw a video the other day. <clears throat> my father-in-law was showing. My father-in-law is like a, a really he he uh, he used to work for one of the big uh, this place called SRT around here that sold a lot of the uh, the guns and the body armor to right. a lot of the local law pre- enforcement law yeah. enforcement around yeah. here. He showed me a video of this guy charging a police officer the cop shoots him at least 11 or 12 times Keeps and the guy's still going yeah. yeah and eventually he hits him like the 13th time and he finally like drops to his knees yeah not done not done yet though never <laughs> seen anything like that man yeah. fucking zombie yeah but um, good luck <laughs> yeah. yeah no i mean a cop dude yeah. i mean that's well, how about the scene we saw you saw the one with the the, uh, the police officer comes out of his patrol car the young black heavy set black girl goes to st- Stab a girl on the ground, and oh, then yeah. goes to stab the girl against the car, who's just right. standing there. Right. And the cop shoots her, and he's a scumbag, low life piece of shit. Right. Yeah, that's the problem with the internet, though. That's like, like I agree that that the 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 cameras are a great thing because it keeps you honest, right? It keeps it, it, it keeps everyone you can honest, see the and you can't lie about what happened. Right. Also, the problem is that once you throw that into something like Twitter, then it's just. Mm-hmm tribalism at its worst you know what i mean everyone wants to pick their like okay before i make my uh, before i form my opinion on this what side am i on <laughs> well yeah well if you start out on a side then you're really that's the problem you're never you're, yeah. you're, you're gonna there's gonna be a problem right right so you just i like picture me i was a cop so i favor the cops normally but I've been arrested by police officers, okay? <laughs> so I know how to be a little more exacting and judgmental of their actions. So, you know, I always say that I think I'm one of the better critics of policing and police work. So if I'm telling you what th- what's going on is correct or it's okay, take it from a guy who's been arrested several times, okay? Right. And, and I didn't like any one of them. But, you know, I did put my hands behind my back eventually because I knew that I was... Sub- submitting to being arrested for something that I did. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not saying I was guilty of said crimes, but, you know, I mean, it wasn't pretty when they came to arrest me. I'll just say that much. I wanted to fucking kill them. I mean, yeah. I Because I, I, they arrested me at work the first time, and then the second time they arrested me, I was out on bail. And it, didn't they storm your house then? Yeah. Yeah. And so all they did was call me in. That's all they did do. But so, they, did, so. they did Roger Stone me. They put the fucking helicopters, the fucking speed, <laughs> speed boats, and every fucking thing else. <laughs> Dogs, searchlights. It's the did middle they, of the day. Did they beat your ass when they did that? They rough you up a little bit? No. I've heard a lot of stories about drug did. dealers getting their ass kicked did. when they get the doors beat down. I had one guy in here saying he almost got, he, he got, they beat his head to a pulp when they, with a, uh, this guy who was an ecstasy kingpin in uh, Arizona. Oh, I mean, you, you might get a beaten. Yeah. Whatever. I don't know. It, 
Whatever. They, it's life. They say <laughs> it's a couple hard knocks here and there. What are you gonna do? <laughs> yeah, but if you, he survived it, if you if you comply with them, you well, would that's think, different. Yeah, you would think that it's, no, okay, yeah, I shouldn't yeah. get my ass beat. No, here. you should. I'm comply. I agree. Just like one hundred percent. You yeah. should not get your ass beat if you comply. Thank you. You're if, correct. If, it should if, never happen. Do you think a problem is a lot of people don't? Was he complying? Cops? Huh? Was that gentleman complying when he? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah, at least he said he was. He, all right. Well, was maybe the, he was. That was his story. No. Yeah. No. No. And he, and he very well could have been because mm-hmm. I know some guys that just so amped up, like mm. they they got to meet justice right here. I mean, dude, this is your job. Just do right, it. Just right. do it right. <clears throat> have the guy say that they treated me like a gentleman. Mm-hmm. So you know that there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. No, that's my opinion. Um, I, I used heard, to buy them beer and fucking uh, chicken. There was a guy. I'm sure you know who he is, Jocko Willink. He talked when he. I heard him talk about police reform and and police and the problem in like the police world right now. And it's that like he compares it to when he was overseas uh, serving in the Marines, um, or he was a Navy SEAL. Or I think he was a Navy SEAL or a Marine. Anyways. He would say, like, when they would go into these foreign countries or whatever, their job was to basically integrate with the with the with the civilians and with everybody, and basically mm-hmm. talk to everybody, figure out what's going on, and basically be like a communication hub for them. Like, talk to them, be friends with them, and try to like solve or complete a mission. Mm-hmm. Um, so, for example, if it's a crack infested neighborhood, the cops should what? Well, I don't know. I'm just I asking. What, what I have no fucking right, clue. Right. I'm just. I'm so just, we they we have that. Yeah, we've had that. We have we call community policing. Mm-hmm. We have um, but, outreach offices, yeah. you know, th- school offices. Right. But the problem is, is never enough, mm-hmm. right? You know, and 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 and, and, and the real world is dangerous. Mm-hmm. It's not like a book, right. you know, because the one guy that 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 that's running the neighborhood's drug spot wants to make the money, and you people don't want the traffic that he's bringing. Right. But if he knocks off one or two of your neighbors. Everybody shuts the fuck up. Mm. It starts to get real. What does they say? It's nothing like getting punched in the face when you walk into a ring. <laughs> Uh-oh, this is a real fight, you know? Right. <laughs> so things change, you know? All that practice, practice is over now. <laughs> yeah, but I think, I mean, he was talking more about, <clears throat> he was talking about, like, like, be, like befriending people and trying to get people to trust him, it, especially in those communities overseas and in these foreign nations like Iraq, like Iraq and Afghanistan or whatever. And... You know, you compare that to, I mean, the fa- the most famous incident, I think, is like the Trayvon Martin incident where you had the ex-cop walking down and the kid, the kid was walking to the uh, the grocery store. He was walking to a house or something like that. Right, right. And in could, Florida. It, was that? Yeah. I think yeah, it was Florida. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah he yeah. was like chasing him down. Like, yeah, hey, the, hey, what the, are you guy, doing? Like, the guy, was a, like the guy was, a, was a civilian, an armed civilian right. with a little bit of a, I think he had a peace officer status. I'm not sure. Yeah. Forget, forget. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, I think the point is, I think the point he was, Jocko was the making. The guy, the guy, talk. listen, the guy, the, the, the guy, the guy did nothing wrong. Right. He just overstepped his bounds. Who did, who, the, the guy who shot yeah. him? Yeah. Right. He overstepped his bounds. He, he overstepped, and they got in a fight, they right. got in a tussle. And, and that's it. You're done. And now now and I'm shot. killing you. And yeah. he shot. You're getting shot. Yeah. Hmm. That's, that's unfortunate. Right. He made a mistake then, Trayvon. Right. The other guy didn't. Hmm. The mistake he made was confronting Trayvon. Hmm. You should just let him go and right. call the police. That's it. Right. That's why they have 911. But the fact that he got involved, mm-hmm. at that point, it's The changed. kid would still be alive if he wouldn't have. If he didn't fight with the guy and just said, okay, I'll comply and wait for the police to come. Right, exactly. I mean, I, 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 he might have been the nicest guy in, the, in America. Yeah. But when someone's armed and they're making a citizen's arrest, they have a choice to protect themselves too. And he was tuning this fucking guy up. Don't get yourself. <laughs> oh, yeah. He was getting tuned the fuck up. The yeah. 17-year-old kid, whatever he was. He was beating was, his ass. He was beating the fuck out of this yeah. guy. And guess <laughs> what? If I got a gun on me, that means it's your gun now. So I ain't giving it up. Yeah, but you instigated the shit. You started the fight, motherfucker, and now you're getting your ass kicked. But Now you're going to kill the kid. No, no. You're going to take my gun and kill me. That's all that matters now. You, punt, you beat my fucking ass. <laughs> Now you're gonna take me and shoot me with my own fucking gun. Yeah. That's the problem. Mm. That's where the problem is. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, well, that's what know. I'm. That's what I'm telling you. Okay. That's what that's you, the problem. Yeah. The problem. The problem was he overstepped his bounds and stopped Trayvon. Instead mm. of just calling the police and said he just ran through the back door over there, whatever you know, mm. have the police confront them. Mm. Instead of doing that, when when he stepped out there and tried to be a citizen police officer, mm. Trayvon now his actions. Ended up causing his death. Mm-hmm. The other guy's actions caused the incident. Trayvon's actions caused his death. Because if you're getting your ass pummeled by somebody and you have a gun, 
it becomes their gun. Do you, do you not connect to no, that? Yeah, yeah, okay. So it, that's yeah. that's the that's why he used deadly physical force to mm-hmm. stop him. Right. So what's school? The, no, no retreat law or something? Or you don't have to retreat or you don't have to fucking get your dick blown off if you you know <laughs> if the guy's fucking got you down and choking you out, you, you let him kill you. You know. Right. Yeah, I guess the the fucked up part is like, what was the reason he was chasing the guy down? You know, the guy didn't do anything wrong. I don't know. He just yeah. looked suspicious yeah. to him. I guess yeah. he's wearing a hoodie. And so he should, like, like I said, call right. the police. Right. Don't confront or them. try to talk to it. You know, even like confronting him. Yeah, okay, yeah confront him, but at least uh, maybe try to communicate like verbally. Yeah, I don't think it was working with Trayvon. He, he was day. sneaking around. You know what I mean? He yeah. wasn't trying to talk to the guy. Like, hey man, what's going on? What are you up to? Like, what what are you what are you going? What's going? What's going? Yeah, on I don't today? know where, where you headed. You know what I mean? Like, 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 like. I feel like. Advanced communication skills, or even well, this guy isn't a cop, too. Yeah, you know? right. That's so true. This guy's true. a civilian right. who has a little. Uh, I think he had a little uh, training as a peace officer, right. so he's not a local cop. He has right. a little training, so now he's got a gun, right. and now he's put himself in a position to be the hero, and now mm. he's a fucking zero, and and right. someone's dead. So I mean, right. but, but that's life. You yeah. know that you know if someone burglarizes your house, of course, right, right, and they're in there doing a good job on it, and you go to stop them, and you they start tuning you up, and right. you know you reach for Uncle Sam under the fucking drawer, and you fire a shot at him, you're probably gonna get arrested, right? <laughs> you're right. probably gonna get arrested, but right. uh, but should you? Uh, right. I think the point I'm trying to get to is when I originally brought it up was like Jocko was saying to become someone that he was to become a Navy SEAL, you have to go through what's called Hell Week, right. which is basically the most. Gr- brutal fucking training that is created to break humans right? right and if you if you want it bad enough to make it through that you can become you can get this job right right right, right. so is that what every cop should do you think so is every yeah That's, every cop should do every cop no well, i'm going to tell you here's your answer i'm going to give you the answer his point was they should go through more or they should have to want it more or they should be more accountable okay so good he's i'm going to give everybody an answer that i gave people 10 years ago 15 years ago 20 years ago now send them to prison first What's that going to do? Send the cop to prison first. Start him out in prison. Then who the fuck wants to do Then no one's going to want to be a cop. Well. We're going to have no cops, Mike. We don't have any anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Start a cop out in prison. If he makes it through a week of prison, he'll understand what it's like to violate someone's rights. He'll understand what it's like to the severity of putting the handcuffs on somebody. And... I mean, so for, so for a cop to put the handcuffs on you, it's nothing for him. It's his job. But what he's just done is change your life irreparably, maybe forever. Mm. And he needs to understand, or she, the magnitude of the decision that they're making and what they're doing to somebody. Because mm. watching someone's family grow up through pictures, as you watch them watch their family grow up through pictures, could sort of put a little sense of humanity into what you're dealing with because cops often don't see humanity when they see a criminal. Mm. They see a crime. And they treat that person in a relationship to the crime that's committed. So someone shoots somebody and kills them. They're a murderer, right? But maybe they just defended themselves. Well, maybe last week the guy raped his daughter Mm. or tried to fuck his mother and so on (laughs) and so on and so forth. So... So now you're, you just saw someone shoot and execute somebody. But you know what? Is he really that bad of a human being? You know, right. the guy who had his daughter on his lap and he was trying to fuck his daughter yesterday. You know? So how bad is this guy today? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, everybody, <clears throat> more, when you bring morality into it and, and, and reason for putting someone in prison, obviously, you know, there's going to be nuance. But... I think when it comes to like how experienced you are, how trained you are and, and whatever it is with, with using weapons or defending yourself. And if you've never done it and you get into a, a fight with somebody, right. you should be able to fucking win the fight without having to blow someone's right. head well, off. You, you, know? you, you go ahead and fight. Uh, what's his name? That just knocked out 12 people with one shot. <laughs> You know who is that? Oh, oh, the guy from Miami, the, the Mas- 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 Masdaval. Go ahead. And oh fight. yeah, yeah. Go fight Masdaval, <laughs> trained cop. Good luck. All right. Uh, yeah, if right. you don't have six of you, you got a problem. All right. right so, exactly. So yeah. So yeah. And all cops should be better trained. Yes, mm-hmm. I agree. Mm-hmm. But 
you got to understand, they're trying to turn cops out at a rate. In, in 22 weeks, they're trying to make you a cop, okay? Yeah. So in that time, they're t- teaching you law, social science, I don't know, vaginal work, whatever the fuck they put cops through today. Vaginal uh, work. Whatever. I don't know. You're supposed to be medical doctors. You, you know, you fucking teach people how to breathe. Teach people yeah. how to get laid. I don't know. Yeah, We're yeah. social workers. Yeah. So, so all the stuff they got to learn in the next 22 weeks, and then you got to teach them how to be an expert fighter. <laughs> have at it you know what I mean and don't forget these are these are people that, that are getting paid a salary by a city good luck We're gonna, and, and at the end of it we're going to attach a GoPro to you good luck yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. have at it you know and meanwhile you're still 103 pounds what the fuck <laughs> you know you're 5 foot 4 you're 103 pounds you gotta you know you got a 22 inch weight. you're a dime piece but <laughs> people want to fuck you but you can't fight your way out of a wet paper bag sweet on I'm sorry you know, you not know, only that we're going to pay you fingers. not only that we're going to pay you 40 grand a year yeah right so, I mean, so let's go see what happens let's see how it turns out yeah. mm. so yeah so there's uh there's a lot of reality that's those not some, a good luck yeah i mean so it would be mm. it would be nice if comps would give more self defense classes mm. i would say if they spent 40% of their time in self defense classes rather than all the other shit they deal with mm. um yeah my friend jimmy you want to answer it no oh, okay <laughs> tell him i'm yeah um yeah so right was Jimmy in the documentary? No. no. He's got his own documentary. <laughs> He's got his own documentary? <laughs> Actually, he was at a wedding for Blanco. The Blanco? Blanco? Griselda Blanco? Yeah, he was at their wedding the other day, and uh, he presented them with a painting uh, from Mas- 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 Maserati. How do you say his name? Mas- Masachi, yeah, yeah, J- Jimmy Vegas. J- we call him Jimmy Vegas because he's from Florida. No, he's from he's from Ohio. Moved to Florida, then moved to Vegas. So for some reason, his name is Jimmy Vegas. And uh, but he's a, he's a, he's a pretty talented artist. And uh, so at Blanco's wedding this week, yeah, this week. Which Blanco is it? Do you know the guy, the the, the son, the son the of son of the son of, of the mother. Yeah, wow. Yeah, she he had a big wedding, and he's got a reality show. Does he really? Yeah, he's got. Wow, I don't. Um, I don't. I'm so out of the loop. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. He's got like five million views every week on on, on a reality show on TV, and then he, at the he got married, and in the wedding on TV, it was a real wedding. He really got married. He presented them with one of his pieces of art for um, their wedding gift. Jeez. So, yeah. So it was pretty interesting. That's Some pretty interesting characters out there. You know, we've run into a lot of different people, right? So. That's pretty fucking wild. Yeah, it's pretty cool. When did? Uh, at what point did? Uh, Tiller, what's his name? Tiller Russell. Russell yeah. At what point did he reach out to you and, and say he wanted to make this movie about you? Yeah, so I was in 2012. Okay, I was at that time I was home eight years. Eight, You're already out. Yeah. Yeah, I was home eight, eight, nine years, eight years. And uh, so uh, I was in a car. The girl I was with at the time, her phone rang. Some guy, she thought it was my book agent. I go, what the fuck does he want? He, he hasn't got me, a, uh, he hasn't got me a, a, a publisher yet to do the book. A writer, and uh, so it turned out it was. I thought it was. I thought it was Jeff uh, Schmidt. It was. It was. It was uh, Tilla Russell. And I go, who are you? And how the fuck did you get this number? Like, <laughs> it's not even my number. How'd you get this number? And and uh, it's funny because he would go on to repeat that same verbiage that I used on him. The next four people he called said the same exact thing. He said, they, but they all followed it up with one other thing. What did Mike say? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so he calls up and uh he flies in from la and he meets me and i put him in the car with me and i drive him around and just telling some stories and i said if you do what i tell you you're gonna have a real fucking you're gonna have good fellas in police in the police department i said this would blow good fellas away if you do it right of course it was a documentary it wasn't a, a, a movie but uh so he goes, oh, really? I, I said, yeah. So he, so he goes, tell me, uh, tell me, tell me. So I run off a few stories, and he's fucking got jizz falling out the side of his fucking mouth, and he's on the phone with the this guy, Eli Holtzman, in L.A. He says, we got a fucking star. And I'm like, what? We got a star. <laughs> yeah. Eli, yeah. Are, you, are you listening yeah. to me? Yeah. yeah. He goes, I, I, go, I go, who's the star? He goes, you. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He goes, we've been working on this documentary for six months already. I said, what? I said, and you came to see me at the end? He goes, well, we've just changed the whole thing just now. I go, really? So then I, I helped them design. So they retooled their whole yeah, project they spent a half a million based around dollars. you. They, they spent a half a million dollars. And documentaries don't spend that kind of money. But in this case, they already had a half a million dollars in. And then after meeting me, they said, 
Forget everything we fucking did. Forget about <laughs> it. We got it all. Do, do it all over. Then they had to reach out to the producers for more money, and they went on and they and they put together. And so 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 the seven five documentary was uh, put together. For, uh, it sat on the shelf for almost two and a half years. They're just trying to get it right, and they fucked it up. They fucked it up. They fucked it up. And I, they had guys like. Um, well, the, I can't think of all the names. P. Diddy and all these guys. They they they, they would meet and they and they video. They in like in L. A. They 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 do trial runs in front of people in the industry to see what they yeah what they yeah, thought. Yeah. You know, it's like a focus group. Yeah, exactly. And so anyway, and they all help each other out by doing it. And, and so anyway, so many many people had seen the rough draft and they they had it at three hours at that time. They were looking at it at three hours at that time. So one of the uh, one of the guys. <clears throat> And I, I, I could be saying the wrong names, so I don't want to say the, the names. But one of the guys who's in the industry turned around and said, more him and less the others. Okay? <laughs> Meaning me. Okay. So I guess. So P.S. So they cut it down to an hour and whatever, 40 minutes. And uh, and um, I was amazed by it. But they did a really good job. And But there was 158 versions. 158 Full length versions of the seven five. Well, oh my god, that's what a, a lot nightmare of fucking, for the fucking editors. A lot of fucking work in that thing. So I'm really disappointed. Mm. That, but there's pro- I would say there's probably 156 better ones than the one they let go. Be- really? Because the shit on the cutting room floor would make your hair stand up. Yeah. So it was in fucking incredible. And yeah. who ended up buying it? IFC, uh, uh, all three media produced it with some financing from others, mm. and. Uh, they sold it to IFC. Mm. And IFC, which is a shit organization, ended up... I fucking not even heard of IFC. Yeah. they independent film company. They're, 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 they're part of AMC. Okay. They're the subsidiary of AMC. They put no money into promoting it, zero. Really? Like, I think they put $10,000 in the budget to promote it. I did all the promotion, basically. Yeah. And... Um, so it didn't. It, that seems dumb. It should have been. It should have been. Uh, should have got the award. It should have got the Academy Award for the best documentary. Yeah. It should have. No, yeah, no totally. it should have. One hundred percent should have. Not because I was in it. Not because I was. It was great. No. It, it should have. Incredible fucking story. It should have got the. Uh, what happened was, it got lost in the small film festival in Manhattan. It didn't make it to Sundance. And then after they after they agreed to to take it, uh, this this little small shit for show in, in in the West Village, Sundance called the next week and said we want it. And they said, well, we already committed. I'm like, F- fuck that. Sundance is where you want to... They said, listen, you can't get a bad name in the industry. If you back out of these little film festivals, I don't give a fuck about the next film. I care about this film. Uh, whatever. I got no control, you know? Right. So they didn't go to Sundance. If you don't go to Sundance, you're not getting a fucking... You're not yeah, getting that's what I mean. Let these fucking nerdy little industry cucks try to dictate your... If you would if you would have been in charge, look, motherfucker, I was the one making all this money dealing with on the streets. Like, right. if you want someone to sell this thing, it's me, motherfucker. And, and I'm still selling it. I'm still selling it. And what the fuck are they doing? Nothing. 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 Fucking God me. Damn shame. They're fucking me. Are you at least getting paid? No, I got it from gotta, them. Are they paying you? I'm supposed to get paid after they, they haven't turned a profit. They said for three years on Netflix, they haven't turned a profit. Yeah, that's the problem. That I think that that industry, I think the big film, music industries, television industries, they're all they're all corrupt. They're on their way out. Right. They're well, corrupt. Yeah. They're corrupt. They're on their way out because yeah. they fuck over artists. Yeah. They, they fuck over talent. Right. And they're infamous for fucking over talent. There's right. d- tons of doc- go to Netflix. You can watch a thousand documentaries right. like that that, uh, that expose music industry, the film industry, the TV entertainment industries for for doing this. Right. And because of that, because of all this light being shined on it, they're on their way out. And now, like, people like you, artists, talent, people who have great stories, they're creating their own platforms on things like right. YouTube or anywhere right. else. And they tell it, and then right. and they build their own platform. Right. And, they, and the audience is what dictates right. what they do. Yeah. Well, this is what I'm working on right now, so we'll see yeah. what happens. It's just, it's tough when you're a solo band. You know, you, you, you know I'm not together with the other guys doing it. You know, if, if, mm. if I could get on board with each other and we could pool our funding and, and, and maybe we can do something bigger together but you know have we, you thought about doing something like this just a talk show no well th- this is this I would this I'm, this I'm gonna do I'm, yeah. I, I just I, I wanna have a I don't wanna go half cocked okay I don't wanna do a studio or a podcast that's lacking I wanna have everything in a podcast that, that you have in a podcast you know I wanna have a guy working in, with me in a booth, booth I want the editor I want the cameras I want the system set up I don't want to go like off the phone like some people do and just have I just don't that's not I, I want to be real you know I want to I want to mm. be impactful 
So yeah, a lot of people say that. I've had a lot of guys on here that say that, and it's it, it hinders them from getting started. It does. It does. It, does. it, it has. Mm-hmm. I actually was involved in a short podcast that was set up like this for about uh, six episodes. It was called uh, The Mike and Mike Show. And it really was very good because I was, I was a big part, part of it. And, uh, and it was a gr- good, good feed off the guy that I was working with. He was basically the straight man. And... Uh, and I had like five or six episodes we did, and uh, and it, was it like a like a like one of those edited podcasts with music where it tells a story or was no it? no it was just him and me kicking it talking okay. about the day talking about the day and it was pretty it was pretty cool. really yeah we talk about the day and then we I do some analogies from synopsis from my past and connect with today and tomorrow and 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 just just kicked it you know and talked about you know the air conditioning unit not working oh yeah you know I yeah. I plugged one up you know <laughs> yeah I don't think the air conditioning is working in here it's, it's hot as fuck in here hot, right now yeah. Well, uh, where can people uh, that are listening or watching on YouTube? Where can they find your? Uh, do, are you? Well, right, what, what are you pushing? So right now, I'm I'm just doing. I'm really just. Uh, so, I'm, I have the cigar line that's that's been still available. It's just I haven't I haven't. Uh, what it is is there's some issues getting stuff from the DR to here because it's a very high tax. So, but you know, if people were interested in getting some cigars, they can contact me through Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. You know, the Mike Dowd on Instagram and Twitter, and Mike, Mike D O W D D O W D, yeah, uh, or um, Michael Dowd on Facebook and stuff like that. I'm really not pushing much right, and right now I'm looking to get my screenplay done, uh, and I'm looking to get my author my book done. I, I, I've almost had it done three times now. It's really getting exhausting. What's stopping you? What's, what's I don't know. I've had it. I've had I've had the set with authors three times and to write it out. And the first author absconded. The next author was no good. We went to a meeting with all the top publishers and we didn't get the deal done. And then because uh, he wrote it like a fucking cunt. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, he uh, he wrote it like a bitch. And and the other guy uh, who's a pretty good writer, uh, he he got four books published. He's sort of back. To, he's and I sat down with him for for two months. It's exhausting going over these these stories and 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 you know reliving them and the passion and the compassion and the feeling that you know you see how I am I'm gesticulating all over the fucking place when they tell these because you, uh, you know they come out of you you physically these stories yeah so uh, and I and I, he's got a hundred page treatment written and I I don't know I don't know I don't know so I got to get the right writer and the right publishing uh, people behind me and get it done or I may end up self writing it but so yeah so. The screenplay and the and the book I'm working on. I have, I own my rights to the book, and I own my rights to a TV series with first right to refusal going back to the people that are doing the movie. You know, they're doing the movie. They, well, so I'm that did that did the movie the no, documentary. No, 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 no. no, okay. no. Okay. So I'm working on the movie right now. Okay, allegedly because it's all in development hell. I'm trying to get the screenplay done because they've dropped the ball now five times on the screenplay. Actually, actually, six times on the screenplay. They've had five different, different screenplays written, and no one. It's not get. It's not catching on. So something's not right. And I don't see any of them. I don't get a chance to see any of them. So I don't know what they're putting out there. But I know what they can put out there, and, and it'll sell tomorrow. So right. If they would just come and sit with me and pay me a fucking decent salary to do it with them, it'll be done. Mm-hmm. That's why I got out of that fucking industry, man. I used to. I used to do the same fucking. I used to live in the same nightmare as you. I used to. That used to be my job. I used to develop. TV show concepts and sell and pitch them to TV networks. And that was the fucking, that was the, the nightmare of it is that you, you push your project onto them. You're the one that knows everything. You're the one that's on the ground. Right. Right. That's I was just, I was more like the, the, the filmmaker. I was one who like package it all, shot it, edited it, whatever. And, and once you, once you pass it off to them, those guys in Hollywood or New York, wherever the hell they are and, and they get their hands on it. It's, it's your, it's, they fuck up the whole they thing. They fuck up the whole. The, yeah. They botch it. They right. botch the whole fucking right. thing. They right. think they think they know no it all. No better. Yeah. Yep. They think right. they know it all. They want right. to take care of their relationships. They yeah. think they. Yeah. How about get the fucking product out there? Yeah. That's good. Right. Right. That's why. Get I got, the good product. That's why I got out of it and started doing this. I started putting it all out on YouTube myself. Don't have to answer it to anybody. Fuck them. Are you doing good? Yeah, good. I'm doing. I'm doing okay. Good. I'm surviving. You surviving? I'm surviving. Uh, yeah. I don't have to worry about about. Putting a meal on the table. You getting you you're, you're feeding the family. Feeding the family. Yeah. That's that's what it's all about, and that's a good thing. And that's why I go on shows, and not that you need me on your show. But some of the guys that like they have like eight hundred viewers. I'll go to their show just to so that I remember who I am. Uh, you mm. know, help the little guy. You know, that's that's what everybody should do. Help the little guy. You know, that's what the life's about. That's what. Yeah. what you know, I mean, you know, whatever. That's how I was raised. That's good, man. That's uh. 
It's noble of you. Where? Well, it cost me a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> you don't. You don't. Do you don't live in Florida, right? You still live in New York, right? Yeah, I still live in New York, but I I have a place down here that I come to several months, like three four months of the year. Myrtle Beach. That ain't in Florida. Right here. <laughs> Yeah. You got That's a condo a here too, motherfucker? No, I have a condo here. Yeah. Really? Clearwater. Clearwater? I, I don't have one in Myrtle Beach anymore. Okay, you sold that one. Or, oh, the feds took it. Something happened. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for doing this, Mike. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I enjoyed this conversation. Well, good. I'm good. I'm glad you had me in. Goodbye, world. Peace. Peace.